So why don't you start? Uh, sure. All right. Well, welcome. Welcome to our virtual welcome day. And uh, my name is Wendy Smith, and I'm the uh, interim chair of the Department of Biology at Northeastern. And I'll let my Hi. colleague. <laughs> mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Kostya Bergman, and I'm the director of undergraduate studies for the biology department. Great. So we're going to. So we're going to tell you a little bit about the biology department. Um, as director of undergraduate studies, I have a lot of responsibility for um, the courses and the advising for the students. And uh, we thought it was really important that you also meet Wendy Smith, who is the chair of our department. Um, we have a little um, PowerPoint to start things off. So the most important th part about this PowerPoint is that uh, We'll give you the URL for the website to get to, for, to, get to our website, because we think that um, rather than handing out information, as we would have done if you had come here, but we didn't because of the snowstorm, you're much better off really getting the information over the web. That way we pollute the world less, and we, um, uh, you can look at it in your time. So uh, the first picture that we have is just what our website looks like. Um, and uh, you can see there's a lot going on here. Some of it's for grad graduate students. Some of it's for undergraduates. I think it's clearly marked. And uh, uh, you can have a chance to go through that yourself. Um, we're very proud of the undergraduate participation in research. And that's one of the things we want to talk to you about today. So. Um, if you go to any uh, biology department anywhere in the country and talk to any biologist, you pretty well hear the same thing. That if you, if you ask them, well, what can I do to do well in biology and to have it help me in my future career, they're going to say, uh, do research in a faculty lab, uh, shadow somebody in a hospital, do something that's different from just sitting in class and makes you distinctive. So uh, one of the advantages we have here is we can leverage our long-standing co-op system to uh, get people to be able to do that. Because there is no, there is no uh, department that has enough faculty for every single student to be doing these things. But by leveraging the co-op system and the lucky thing that we are next to the biotechnology industry, which has a very strong center here and a very strong center of the health industry, um, we can make use of that. This slide that we have up shows um, the nine top co-op employers uh, for our students. And you can see it over the years. It tends to go up and down between different sites. But, um, uh, and you can see that for the last year, we had 440 total co-op placements. Um, this is not just for the biology department. This is the combination of the biology, biochemistry, and behavioral neuroscience. And I, know that you may have heard from some of them before. Um, so the total for the year 2011-12 uh, was 440. And this shows you the top sites. Now you'll see even those of these are nine top sites, it's no way that that is anywhere near 140, 440. And that's because there are many, 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 at least 80 other sites that employ our students. So that's to, just to give you a flavor of it. And our next slide um, shows undergraduate research. And uh, you'll see there that um, these, are, these are the research courses that we've had. Um, so these are students who are in research. And this has had a tendency to go up during the year. The last year is low because it's only a partial year, but it's actually trending to be higher uh, than the, rate, the other years. Um, importantly, um, is that first statement there that during the last, 25, the last five years, excuse me, undergraduates have co-authored 95 conference presentations and 25 publications. And uh, the 25 publications is, uh, we, we're pretty proud of that because having an uh, undergraduate on a, public, a publication is pretty unusual. And finally, um, we've had provost awards. We have the provost office in our university has awards for students doing undergraduate research. And this is just to give you a flavor. This is just for the last year, all the different projects that were going on. We don't really expect you to be able to see what they are from this slide, but just to get the experience, the feeling that there's a lot going on here. Again, this is biology, biochemistry, and behavioral neuroscience. 
And we in the biology f department feel a lot of um, ownership over those programs, even though they're shared with other departments. And um, one thing to know about them is that you can be admitted into the different programs, but uh, basically, for the first two years, the courses are the same. So there's a lot of chance to be able to move from one to the other if you haven't made quite the right choice. So, so yeah, I can chime in here and say, right. you know, having, having I, I, in addition to being a chair, I also teach. And one of my students is actually on the Sprevost Award, uh, you know, for doing research in my lab. Um, but there's a really nice integration between the research profile that the students have and also the classroom um, participation. So that on more than one instance, I've been lecturing on something in cell biology and honestly had a student raise their hand and say, I work in that lab, um, which is just remarkable, absolutely yeah. remarkable. And some right. of these are one of them was Alzheimer's research, another one was aging research, having to do with nutrition down at Tufts. The, you know, the, the students, you, it just kind of blows you away that you've got then this level of engagement of, you know, and then obviously it brings such immediacy to a class like cell biology, which tends to be a very tough class and it's hard to get, you know, all of the material together and to kind of get focused on, on, um, on where this is going to take you. But these students then are able to do that in a very immediate way, which I think is a really great feature of, of this. You know, we're putting a big emphasis here on the research and what they're doing outside of the classroom, but it also brings a lot of richness then to inside the classroom. Right. Well, we have a couple of questions okay. for, for biology. Um, is co-op required to be in the, the bio biology department? And um, can you maybe talk about some of the examples of co-op that you've seen in the past? Well, co-op's not required. Uh, what we do do is require, we along with the rest of the College of Science require some experiential education. And this can take various forms. Some students do internships, some students do something on study abroad, some students work in a faculty lab, or they um, shadow a, a physician or a dentist. Um, there are a number of different possibilities. We definitely, uh, we definitely have terrific participation in our co-op program. It's probably about 90% of the students who do one type, one co-op or another. Um, I think we had some examples on the last slide of possible um, co-ops. We have um, a lot in hospitals. Some of those are in research labs in hospitals. Others are um, helping out in various clinical settings. And uh, um, there's also in the biotech industry, there's research and there's more. Some, some students are involved in certain kind of production, low, low uh, volume production of drugs. If a student is interested in nutrition, what are their courses and co-op opportunities in the Department of Biology? I mean, nutrition is not, we, we don't train people to be nutrition professionals. Um, we train people in the basic science, which is behind nutrition, so the genetics and biochemistry, which are very important for nutrition and nutrition research are definitely part of our program. But if somebody's looking for a program which is going to have them be a nutritionist in the hospital, uh, ours is not the right program for that. Right. Does the, bio does the biology curriculum cover all the pre-med course requirements? Yeah. <laughs> yes. The biology curriculum does cover all of the pre-med course requirements um, as they currently stand. Yeah, absolutely. So once you've completed those, uh, but biology in particular. Um, uh, behavioral neuroscience, do they have physics now? Yeah, it's, it's more or less the same. More or less, yeah. So, so um, yeah, we, we did, we, uh, you know, it, it's all the same foundation um, that the medical schools want. It's also what we want. So it's, it's a pretty easy, uh, a pretty easy fit. Um, right. And we haven't had trouble over the years in maintaining that, you know, that fit between our you know, one year of bio, you know, as a, as a baseline, the chemistry baseline, the physics baseline, and that that's been required by the medical schools. Yeah. You may have heard that there's some changes going on in um, the pre-medical requirements, and we are keeping uh, very close track of that. We see it as an important opportunity to um, change and modernize our curriculum, uh, because Biology departments all over the country, the curriculum has, uh, the base of the curriculum is set by the pre-medical requirements. This is because many students come to university planning to go to medical school. 
So yes, uh, we, have a, we actually have a presentation about the um, pre-health advising program, which is um, not directly a part of our department, it's run, but it's run for the whole university by some, somebody who works in our department. And so every university has a pre-health and pre-medical advisory system, which is essentially required by the medical schools. Um, so we have a slideshow on that. And um, so the, the first slideshow is just to tell you the important things that, uh, uh, that's necessary, tell you that we have two people who are in charge of this. Um, the program is not just for biology majors, it's for all people who connected to Northeastern University. We have people preparing for allopathic, meaning regular MD or osteopathic medicine, dentistry, optometry, podiatry, veterinary medicine. Um, uh, and then uh, it's for, mostly for American medical schools, but they certainly give help for people who decide to go to medical schools that are not in the U.S. Um, this, is, this is a picture of the medical schools that our alumni are, are where some of them are now. You can see there's a long list. And what does it take? Um, academic excellence, in experience and engagement, by which we mean um, doing things like co-op and uh, clinical and community service, personal qualities, preparation, with which we give a lot of help for, with our um, pre-med advising team. And finally, this, this tells you um, some, this is the basic requirements which are for people in biology and also for people in social sciences and humanities. All of our uh, programs have these courses as part of them. And we are keeping up with the changes of the require that maybe the changes that the medical schools are making in their requirements. Um, so finally, um, this, this just shows you again the I'm not quite sure what that go, the northeastern.edu slash COS is, but I, you will get to the pre-health advising programs go, starting there. And uh, um, you can be assured that, in fact, if you type pre-health and neu.edu into, um, into Google, you will find our programs. Okay. okay. We have a, a few more questions that have come oh. in during this presentation. Um, one person asks, could you explain the BS in biology, MS in biotechnology, plus one program? Oh, that's yeah. a good question. That's good. Yeah, this is a program. This is actually a very small program. It has some room to grow, but it's really for people who've decided that they want to work in industry. It's not something to pick up along the way to medical school or to add to degrees, a little bit like a charm bracelet. It's really for people who are very serious about wanting to work in the biotechnology industry. And um, we have found that uh, some of our, uh, our upper level courses, some of them are very relevant to um, the work that goes on in the biotechnology industry. So that if students take the right courses in their uh, later years, in their junior and senior years, they can get about halfway through a master's program in biotechnology. So we formalize that in this plus one program. And the way it works is students are admitted to this program around their junior year, definitely after their fifth semester at Northeastern. And uh, they, they then do those right courses. And uh, then they get their undergraduate degree and they have the opportunity to continue in the biotech industry and to get paid basically while they continue to do the um, last year of, of um, work and they end up with a, in a stronger position. As I said, it's really for students who make that decision. And it has to key very tightly to the biotechnology master's program which we have, which is uh, designed really uh, in a very specialized way, which we can talk about. It's, it's, a, it's a good program though. I was just, a, yeah. I had two students I was teaching a, scene, uh, a graduate uh, seminar on aging actually, and I had two um, plus ones that were in the, one uh -huh. my class two years ago. And uh, one of them said Merck now, happy as a clam, and the other one got a job out at, in San Diego. She's, in her, she's at her second company now. She's moved up. Right. Um, and also, she's on Facebook with her, and she's like, you know, she's got 
the surfboard, and she's talking about, oh, I finally got a weekend free, you know, because I'm really busy at work, and um, just, just doing really, really well. So it's really nice to see, um, you know, the success that comes out of that. They're really happy with their choices. They're really happy with their careers. Um, you know, it's, it's, a, it, it's a window on, on uh, you know, a way that you can pursue a scientific research career without necessarily going right on, you know, to a PhD. Okay, and another question. Will the curriculum prepare for the MCAT? Yes. I mean, the, the statement that we make that we're keeping up with the changes is serious. There are changes in the medical school admissions and changes in the MCAT. There are changes, yeah, in the MCAT. The MCAT does seem to be a pretty tough um, exam. And even there, we found that the pr various prep courses and so on may not help students that much. It's really um, testing their, you know, that they've been paying attention for the, the years before. Our pre-health people are pretty, they're very helpful and they're kind of directive in helping students not to kind of take the MCAT as a practice exam or something. They have very specific instructions about when you should take it and that uh, comes with a lot of wisdom. Um, are all the introductory level courses in the biology department taught by PhDs? Yes. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yes. The, the lecture classes are, the lab classes are, um, are taught by our graduate students under the supervision of, of PhDs. Um, they're occasional, not self-standing, though, right. sort of associated with, right. the, with the lecture classes. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And then what is the average size of an introductory level course? Well, that depends on the course. Um, in Biology, I think the largest introductory course we've had this year was about 125, which is reasonable. The chemistry courses have been larger, so I think their courses are, can be about, about 200. They're broken down into sections. For chemistry, there's both a lab section, which is 20 or 19, 20, and, uh, and um, a recitation section, which is also smaller. In our case, we have the lab sections. Um, so. Uh, math, they're lower. They're not as big as that. Um, these things are constantly evaluated as whether it's better to have a big class and then breaking it down to smaller ones. Uh, that way you have stronger people lecturing or do you have more lectures there you, then you start to have a quality control problem. This goes back and forth. Potential quality control problem. So um, it's a good question. Uh, I think you were driving at how big they are. <laughs> Smaller than some places, bigger than some places. Okay. Um, can a student graduate in four years? Yes. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Yeah, and they can graduate in four years and still do a co-op. Right. It's just they can't do three of them. Right. But yeah, that, that, that's a mix that we see right. really often. Our students that will take one co-op or they'll do four and a half and they'll do two. Um, so there's a lot of flexibility. But yeah, if you want to go straight through in the four years. Right. You know, what we, what we, uh, what, there is a common misunderstanding about co-op and the five years. Everybody has eight semesters, so in that sense it's four years. Some people take a bit longer, um, and this, this is in some sense, many students now take gap years. Most students going to medical school do not go four years to undergraduate school and then go to medical school directly. Most have some sort of a gap in there. So um, there's sometimes a lot of um, um, discussion about people who seem to be in a hurry, but generally we find that once people are here, uh, they slow down a little bit yeah. and, and look around and take advantage of some of the opportunities. If I want to double major, what major, in addition to biology, do you suggest I look into? Mm -hmm. Well, that should be dependent on your interest. Um, if you're interested in English literature, then I would suggest that you do that. If you're, um, I, we try to discourage people from doing s and majors that are very close together with the idea that they're, they're getting much more. A um, certain number of people do double major in biology and chemistry, um, but we also have what we think is a better approach, which is our biochemistry degree, which is between the two departments. It's really your interest, because I mean, right. thinking of students that are in my classes, I've had some double major, you know, biology and philosophy. Yeah. 
and to be interesting biology, These yeah. days, biology and international relations is very popular. Yeah, I'm not exactly. Sure why. And we've had some uh, joint with the business school. That's a little bit harder to <laughs> manage, but if you come in with that, uh, you know, with that strategy, you can definitely do it. Um, you know, so there's there are a lot, and it really, you know, like Kasha says, it's a matter of of um, what your interests are and good planning. Um, and you can, you can manage some really, really interesting combinations. Yeah, we also do have a combined major with the College of Computer Science. So there is possible to do a computer science biology major. And since computer science is much, much more important in biology these days, that's, yeah. that's a good, we have a few students a year who do that. And would the curriculum in the biology, in a biology major, would you still have the opportunity to take foreign languages if you were interested? Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. there's yeah, plenty of room for that. And for study abroad, you routinely have students that will be able to, to take a full semester abroad. We also have the dialogues, which are smaller um, um, pieces of, of, uh, of going abroad. But, but I've had multiple students that have done study abroad in various places for the full semester. And another question, what percentage of students get into medical school? Well, we don't do it by percentages. We don't really know the percentage that get in. Um, and uh, that's a difficult question because we don't know what the bottom number should be, what the denominator should be. Should it be everybody who came in the beginning saying they wanted to go to medical school? Or should it be the ma many fewer people who apply? Some schools put limits on who's allowed to apply to medical school. Who will, who will they, their pre-health advising people will talk to based on uh, GPA and other things. We don't do that. Anybody who wants to give it a try, right. we, we will help. We, will help. Uh, we may help partly by saying, you know, you should take a little longer, you should sit, get some of these grades up. We're not going to, it's not all passive kind of help, but we do help. Okay. We have someone who wants to know what the kind of research opportunities are available for undergraduate students. Well, in our department, um, we have a lot of research active faculty and so there are positions in their labs and some of those people work in microbiology, some of them work in physiology, some of them work in um, cell biology. Um, what am I leaving out? Is that uh, uh, yeah, well, neurobiology? Yeah. And so um, there are opportunities in those labs. Um, there are also opportunities um, to do research in the, in the biotech industry through the co-op program. But I think if you go down, you know, our web page, right. just, you know, the, to click on faculty, that we would be hard pressed to find a single faculty member that has not had undergraduates working in their lab. Right. I mean, every picture you're going to be able to. Th I mean, I, recently, you know, I'm going to be able to think of people that have been in those, you know, in those um, labs. So it's, you know, it's not that we can take every single person you know, who's coming in every single semester, but if you have a real interest, and particularly if you've taken a course with somebody and so you've got that connection and you've taken the initiative to say that you're interested in working with them, we, we have lots of opportunities. Okay. And as a wrap-up question, I guess, um, why should a student choose the biology department here at Northeastern opposed to any other university that they've been accepted to? Well, I think our strongest strength is um, our commitment to the co-op program, to our, our location right here. It wouldn't be possible if we weren't located in Boston and, had the, and didn't have the biotech industry there and the hospital industry here. The, the, the richness of that, having the co-op program isn't enough because you could have a co-op program someplace where they don't have those kind of resources. And um, that's pretty unique. Um, you know, we have lots of other good things about uh, Boston as a college town. Um, there's lots of things for students to do. We have a nice campus if you get to visit it, if you haven't been able to. Um, but I think the strongest thing we have is this commitment to uh, involving students in the real work that goes on in science. Yeah, yeah I, I, I would agree. I think it's, it's definitely, you leave Northeastern with um, so much uh, richer an experience, um, having done real work um, in, in co-op opportunities and uh, you get a better
better idea of what you don't want to do, <laughs> yeah. uh, as well as what you want to do. Um, your resume has, you know, has real depth to it. It's, it's you know, it's not a matter of just a what, what can I stick on there that's going to look good. But you know, then when you go into an interview with that resume and somebody says, well, tell us, uh, you know, how you troubleshot that technique. You know, what, you know, how did you do it instead of that deer in the headlights in most schools where you're like, well, I did that as part of a classroom lab, and honestly, if I had to do it as part of my work experience, I'd be maybe a little bit, you know, have less depth. You know, for, for our students who have done that on a daily basis for six months, they're going to be like, well, you know, I know when the HPLC went down, you know, <laughs> how to stick it together, you know, with glue and duct tape and actually manage to get that experiment still running. It's a very different level of depth of experiences. Um, and, you know, and then the variety of experiences also are going to let you, like I say, rule in and rule out so that you come out at the end of that four, four and a half, five years um, with a, just, a, I think, a very, very different um, type of experience than you could get anywhere else. I think that's true. Oh, it's true. I, yeah, it really is. Good.